Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a mystery podcast. I'm your host, Kadra, and today we will be getting into a true crime case. This has a lot of extreme religion slash cult elements to it, and I didn't know it was going to be this big of a story, like in terms of how long it would take to explain all of this and unpack it. So this is going to be a two-part in part one, we will be getting into a, a lot of plot development, and this is a very heavy story. So I just want to preface this by saying, trigger warning, we will be getting into domestic violence, animal violence, and of course other topics that may be considered disturbing to some listeners. So sensitive listening is advised, especially for listeners below the age of 16. And all of the sources that I used for today's episode will be available in the show notes. Brenda Wright was born in July of 1960 in Logan, Utah, to parents Dr. James Lewis Wright and Lorraine Hatch Wright. Her family was religious. They were raised as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or LDS, and Brenda grew up in a big family with many siblings. She was the second oldest, and from what I could find, she had two sisters that were close to her in age, named Betty and Bonnie, along with a few other sisters that were younger, named Joanna and Sharon. Brenda's family later moved to New York so that Brenda's father, James, could finish school. He was getting his doctorate at Cornell. Eventually, the Wright family would settle in Twin Falls, Idaho. And Brenda had a great childhood, by all accounts. It would be considered idyllic. She had two educated and very supportive parents, and the Wrights also encouraged their kids to be self-sufficient, independent, and Brenda was a very well-rounded child. She had a lot of hobbies. She enjoyed riding horses and visiting her grandparents on the farm. Brenda's sister Sharon would also describe her as very compassionate and nurturing. Brenda was also known to step in and help and kind of be a second mother to the younger siblings when her parents were away or busy. She was just incredibly kind, selfless, and warm by all accounts. She was also very beautiful and intelligent. She liked doing what a lot of teenagers did. She would sing in her car. She liked going on drives with her friends. But she also loved to read and scrapbook. She loved Lord of the Rings so much that she learned to speak and write in Elvish. She wasn't afraid to be goofy. She would burp the whole alphabet. She later went on to do well in pageants where she would often sing. And throughout all of this time, Brenda kept a very strong faith. She was heavily involved in her church at LDS and she was very thoughtful. She was known to remember everyone's birthdays. She would write them cards. And she was even the editor of her high school yearbook. Brenda was also an incredibly driven person. She had big dreams to pursue broadcast journalism, and she knew that she wanted to go to college. Eventually, her ultimate dream was to be an anchor woman on television. So she did several years of college schooling in Idaho before she transferred to BYU in Utah. She pursued studies in communications, and she even landed a job as a news anchor. There, she even joined a group of young LDS followers, and this is where she would meet a man named Alan Lafferty. He wasn't a student, but he was a young adult in the area, and Alan was born to Watson and Claudine Lafferty. The Lafferty family was very prominent, and they were a well-respected family in Utah, Watson Lafferty was the patriarch, he was a chiropractor, and he ran a successful business out of his home. Alan began working as a tiler at a young age, and he continued to tile as an adult. He had five brothers and two sisters, so he came from a big family with many siblings as well, similar to Brenda, and they were also very involved in the LDS church. They were very devout, the Lafferty's. Alan was the youngest, and to people on the outside looking in, the Lafferty's were, as I said, a, a prominent family to respect and look up to. They seemed to have everything together. But behind closed doors, the Lafferty's had a lot of dark secrets. So important quick sidebar, 
The LDS is basically part of Mormonism. The Church of Latter-day Saints, basically, they don't believe in certain beliefs that the Mormons used to in the older days, like polygamy. That's one of the main differences. And in the LDS, they do still have a lot more of those old school mentality beliefs. For example, in LDS faith, it's not uncommon to believe that physical punishment is appropriate for your children and even for your spouse when they, using air quotes, misbehave. So this was a very common practice in the Lafferty family, but it was so common and so severe that it was incredibly abusive. Watson Lafferty also had some, let's just call them unique beliefs. He believed the government and the church should intermingle, and he also had very far-right extremist political views that made him stand out in the town. He was known to severely beat his children and his wife, Claudine, into submission. One time, The children had done something to upset Watson, who knows what it was. And so his idea of punishment was to beat their family dog to death in front of the children. So that should give you some insight into what horrible things were going on in the Lafferty family. Watson also did not trust doctors or the healthcare system. He was known to use homeopathics and prayer when he or any of his family members were sick. There was a time where one of his daughters had acute appendicitis and he refused to take her to the hospital. He insisted that the family should just pray for her and she would recover. It wasn't until her appendix burst and she was hours away from dying that Watson begrudgingly took her to the hospital. Luckily, this girl survived, but she would have surely died if Watson wouldn't have taken her to the hospital. Watson also had diabetes, and again, because he didn't believe in modern medicine, he left his diabetes untreated. He would just pray and use homeopathics. So without shock, he quickly died in 1983. So that's just a little bit of background on the Lafferty family, but we're gonna talk about them a lot more later. So this is where two worlds would collide. We have Brenda, who is progressive, well-rounded, confident, uh, independent and intelligent. And she came from having two incredibly supportive parents and this just idyllic childhood. And then we have Alan Lafferty, who had these intense, patriarchal beliefs because of his upbringing. He came from an abusive, far-right household, and they didn't believe in what most people believe in today, like medicine and the importance of following the law and trusting the government. But despite all of this, Alan and Brenda met each other, and they were both devout LDS. They were around the same age, and they quickly bonded and developed a strong relationship. It wasn't long before Alan met Brenda's parents in 1981, and they seemed to like Alan a lot. So Brenda and Alan quickly got married on April 22nd, 1982, which was the same weekend that Brenda would graduate from BYU. They later settled in American Fork, Utah, which is a small suburb. Brenda would become a wife, and she continued to attend Temple on a weekly basis while also working as a news anchor. She was pursuing her dream. She got the guy. So her dreams were coming true. Everything was going well for Brenda. But as soon as her dreams came to fruition, Alan told her, he didn't want her working. This is a common belief among LDS community, which is essentially built on a patriarchy. However, Brenda's family was unique in the church and she was progressive. She believed that women should work and that they were equal to men. Her parents, again, had taught her to be independent and educated. And so that's exactly what Brenda planned to do. This was also not explained anywhere, like if Brenda and Alan had discussed these things prior to them getting married, or some people think Alan could have hidden his beliefs or love bombed her. And then she found all this out later. So I'm not sure, but... It seems like Brenda didn't know that Alan had these beliefs until after they got married. But basically, 
a lot of their fundamental beliefs mismatched. Brenda kept a journal, and in her journal, she wrote about how she often felt like she made a mistake marrying Alan. Brenda very quickly also became pregnant. Just two months after they got married, Brenda was pregnant with a baby girl, and she would later give birth to Erica Lane Lafferty on April 28th, 1983. She put her broadcasting career on hold to be a mom, but mostly it seems like she did this just to appease Alan. Brenda did later get a job working at the mall, mostly for health insurance, but again, Alan began to pressure her to stop working. He wanted her to solely financially rely on him. She was even later offered the job of her dreams, teaching in the communications department at BYU. But when she talked to Alan about the job, he didn't want her to take it. So she didn't. It seems like another reason that Alan didn't want Brenda to work is because she often looked at jobs with major corporations, and Alan had an extreme distrust in the government. He also had major distrust in banks. He continued to work in the tiling business, but he always insisted to be paid in cash. Alan Lafferty didn't even have a checking account. He didn't have a checking account because he feared that the IRS could track him. He didn't even have a social security card. So Brenda is, of course, becoming more and more aware of these red flags, and she's constantly struggling with Alan and their mismatched beliefs. Another example of this is when her and her sister wanted to go out to eat on a weekday. Alan insisted on going, and he drove them. So he drove them from restaurant to restaurant, and he would not allow them to go in and eat anywhere if the establishment was open on Sundays. He basically refused to support any corporations that were open on a, the day of the Lord, basically. So he would make them stay in the car, and he would go into each restaurant, and if they were open on Sundays, he would leave, and they wouldn't be allowed to eat there. And this continued from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant, because the vast majority of restaurants are open on Sundays. So eventually, Brenda becomes so embarrassed and frustrated that she just asked Alan to take her and her sister home. But all of this is going on, and Brenda continues to hold on for the sake of her newborn daughter, Erica. Brenda was also a great mom. By all accounts, she enjoyed being a mom, but she still had dreams to go back to work. She planned to return to work once baby Erica was more grown, but tensions and disagreements continued between Brenda and Alan. When it came to filing taxes, Alan refused. Brenda, however, was a law-abiding citizen, and she insisted that she do this, so she got her father to help her with filing the tax forms. Similar issues would also arise when their licenses would expire, and Alan would refuse to renew them or allow Brenda to renew hers. And when their insurance premiums were due, Alan refused to pay them. But somehow, time and time again, Brenda would make sure these things were filed and done. So if, as if this marriage wasn't already problematic enough, and I told you we're gonna go back to the Lafferty family, enter the Lafferty brothers. Dan Lafferty, like his father, was a chiropractor and a very devout member of the LDS church. He worked at the family business in Utah and was married to a woman named Matilda. Dan and Matilda had four children together, and Dan also had quite a fascination with the LDS church and specifically the history of Mormonism. He had done a lot of research on Joseph Smith, and throughout this research, he came across a 19th century text that Joseph Smith had written called The Peacemaker. This text included extremely patriarchal beliefs on marriage and parenting. The text also encouraged polygamy. And as Dan continued to study these extreme beliefs, he began to adopt them into his life and enforce them in his family. He didn't believe in public schooling, so his children were homeschooled. Any clocks and watches in the home were thrown away. And the only books that the children or Matilda were allowed to have in the house had to be about Mormonism. His wife, Matilda, was also only allowed to wear dresses, 
and she was no longer allowed to drive or manage money. Matilda couldn't even interact with people outside of her family unless Dan was present. So similar to his father, Dan Lafferty also spanked Matilda any time that she disobeyed him, using air quotes. And he did not believe in traditional medicine either. So all of this basically began over the course of a couple of years, and we'll get more into it. But when Dan and Matilda got married, he originally did not present these beliefs to her. She could manage money, she could drive, she could wear pants, etc. So all of these things happen over the course of the next year or two, and tensions begin to rise between Matilda and Dan Lafferty. Eventually, Matilda had had enough of this, and she began to fight back. She encouraged Dan to go ahead and find another wife so that she could leave him. And one time, she let their chickens out of the chicken coop, and she let them loose in the house so that they could be free and poop all over the house, just knowing this would piss Dan off. Dan became enraged by Matilda's extreme behavior, and the physical violence began to escalate. Dan started to severely beat Matilda, and then he began to speak of acquiring new wives. At one point, he set his sights on his 14-year-old stepdaughter, Rebecca. For whatever reason, this, thank God, never happened, but he did eventually marry another woman. I do want to say, though, there seem to be a lot of sources that speculate about this. Like some people say that Dan did marry Rebecca for a short period of time. Other people believe he sexually assaulted her. Other people say they never got married and it was just this idea he had and nothing ever happened. But I do think that's important to mention here. But at this point, Dan had gained so much abuse and control over Matilda and his children that they were very in fear of him. And Matilda feared for her life and her children's lives. She felt, though, that she couldn't leave this horrific situation. If she tried to, she believed Dan would surely kill her and the kids. In 1981, when the Lafferty patriarch Watson was still alive, he went away on a trip for a while, and he left Dan in charge of the family business. And there was a point where Watson was gone and property taxes for the business were due, and Dan refused to pay the property taxes. This was because he believed if he paid taxes, the government owned the property and they would have a right to take it. Watson eventually returned into town and he found out about this, and he was of course pissed, but he paid the taxes just in time to save the business. Dan's beliefs continued to escalate, and he became acquainted with a man named Prophet Onias. Prophet Onias sucked. He was a racist, and he had extreme beliefs. He believed black men should not ever be prophets, and he was the founder of the School of Prophets. So Dan gets well acquainted with Onias and begins spending more and more time with him, and This, of course, just makes Dan more and more bold in his beliefs because now he has someone to support these deranged ideas. Another brother in the Lafferty family that is very important in this story is Ron. Ron Lafferty was married to a woman named Diane, and they also lived in Utah and had six kids. Ron was a successful contractor that worked in construction, And growing up with his other siblings, Ron was often seen as the mediator. He did not like conflict, and he was seen as very considerate and empathetic. As an adult, he was often seen by others as reasonable and very family-oriented. So with everything going on with Dan Lafferty and the School of Prophets, Dan's getting more and more bold with his beliefs, and he starts telling his brothers about all of these beliefs and encourages them to join the School of Prophets. So they start having regular meetings together during the week where they would discuss religion and politics. By the time it's 1982, several of the Lafferty wives are absolutely miserable because Dan has basically put all of these beliefs 
on his brothers. And I mean, they all have similar backgrounds. So it was easy for them to get wrapped up in this as well and begin to believe and practice it. So they also began to abuse and control their wives. It's believed that Alan Lafferty was not involved in the School of Prophets, but he was heavily encouraged to join and he was very aware of what was going on at these meetings. And at this point in the story, Ron Lafferty was not involved either. But the other Lafferty brothers, Tim, Mark, and Watson Jr. were involved and would regularly attend the School of Prophets. So Diane, Ron's wife, starts to hear from the other wives about what's been going on with their husbands and how upset and scared they are. So Diane became so concerned that she tells Ron, the mediator, about this. Basically like, hey, can you go set your brother straight and get this fixed? This is ridiculous. Ron is also worried and he agreed. He said he would go to the meeting straighten this out and put an end to all of this. Ron shows up to this meeting and he warned his brothers that these beliefs were extreme and false and dangerous. He said these beliefs were against the foundation of faith for LDS and that they were putting their souls in jeopardy and at risk for eternal damnation. He also called Dan an embarrassment to the LDS community. But Dan Lafferty was in his soul so sure that he was right, that he was not backing down. So he argued with Ron Lafferty and Dan insisted that polygamy was the key to becoming devout. Dan also said that when Mormonism abandoned this belief, they were doomed. And in a matter of hours, it's said that Dan changed Ron's mind completely. So when Ron left that meeting, the School of Prophets had gained a new member. Ron returned home later that night, and Diane would later tell a friend that it was as if a completely different person walked through the door. This was not the man that she married. Ron began to show paranoid tendencies similar to Dan. He threw away his driver's license. He took the license plates off of his vehicle and he even quit his job. This quickly put Ron's family into extreme turmoil to the point where it became difficult to provide for their kids, give them adequate food and clothing. Ron also began to abuse Diane. Desperate and in fear for herself and her children, Diane began to reach out to the LDS church for help and to other trusted members of the family, including Brenda Lafferty, Alan's wife. So Diane decides it's best to separate herself from Ron at this point, and she files for divorce. This whole situation ended up bringing Diane and Brenda closer together, and Brenda was very supportive of Diane. And you have to think about the religious beliefs surrounding this too. Like being in the LDS community or any extreme religion for that matter, when you are in an abusive situation and you need to leave or get divorced, it's seen as a sin. A lot of people still to this day believe that if you get a divorce, you are sinning, you're going to hell, or that you need to stick it out and it's just wrong to leave the marriage. Some people seriously think that prayer is going to get rid of abuse. So Diane, I'm sure, felt very judged and alone at this point. So having listening and supportive ears like Brenda's meant the world to her, I bet. But of course, the Lafferty brothers begin to notice that Brenda is supporting Diane and helping her get out of this situation. And being people who abuse and control women, they don't like this. They don't like this one bit. So Ron began to get very outspoken about his animosity towards Brenda for helping Diane. Ron even called Brenda a bitch in front of Alan and warned Alan he better get control of Brenda and that Brenda better stop meddling in his family's affairs. So he basically threatened her. Brenda tells Alan, basically like, I don't know what is going on with your brothers and these insane things that they've started doing, but 
I am not okay with it at all, and I do not want you spending time with them. So I'm not sure at this point if Alan wanted to go to the School of Prophets, if he was interested in any of the meetings, or if he wasn't. But whatever the case, Alan did listen to Brenda, and he did not go to any of these meetings. Diane's divorce eventually became finalized, and she relocated to Florida. She left Ron and took all six of her children with her. And this seems to be a big turning point for Ron Lafferty. Dan Lafferty continued to constantly get in trouble with the law for traffic violations, tax evasion, and breaking licensing regulation laws. And he and his brothers, Ron, Tim, Mark, and Watson Jr. continued to attend the School of Prophets, and their beliefs became more and more extreme. Eventually, they were excommunicated from the LDS church in 1983. And this is the same year that their father, Watson, died. So a lot of tipping points. Everything's beginning to boil. The School of Prophets also began to grow in numbers, gaining more and more members. And of course, these members were all men. Around this time, Prophet Onias began to get many quote-unquote revelations from God. And Prophet Onias is still the leader of the School of Prophets at this point. So when these revelations started happening, this is when the purpose of these meetings shifted from debates and discussion on religion and politics to becoming more about how to receive and interpret messages from God. It wasn't long before Ron Lafferty began to claim he was receiving many messages from God. Ron would also write these messages in his journal. Later that same year, Ron visited Oregon and he spent some time at a polygamist commune. At the commune, Ron had alcohol for the very first time. He became enticed by alcohol, and he felt like it heightened his sense of the spirit. So I think this is important to point out, too. It's like Ron's wife just left him. He grew up in an abusive household. We know he is capable of being an abuser towards women, potentially towards his children, too. We know he hit his wife, Diane. And now he is having alcohol for the very first time. So we're introducing substance to someone who already has violent tendencies and is showing clear signs of mental illness. So it's not looking good at all. Ron would eventually leave this polygamist commune in Oregon and he would return to Utah. He attended a School of Prophets meeting and he brought wine with him and insisted that everybody in the group should drink wine instead of water or juice which they would often serve at the meetings as a sacrament. This was against the School of Prophets' fundamental beliefs. So Ron brings all this wine to the meeting. He drinks several glasses of wine and he gets very intoxicated. Ron then began to mock Prophet Onias because he refused to drink the wine. Ron also began to insist that the Lafferty brothers should take over these meetings and that Onias was no longer fit to run the School of Prophets. Dan and Watson Jr. also supported this decision. So Prophet Onias actually listened. He took a step back and Ron and Dan Lafferty began to run these meetings. In addition, alcohol was introduced to this already violent and dangerous group of men. Ron also began to reflect on the loss of his wife, Diane, and his six children. And Ron is enraged. He's looking for someone to blame. So he begins to place the blame on Brenda Lafferty. After all, Brenda supported Diane, and she was everything that Ron now hated about women. She was independent, progressive, and against the patriarchy. Ron also blamed Richard Stowe and Chloe Lowe, who were members of the LDS Church, and they helped Diane immensely in leaving Ron. They provided financial support, emotional support, and resources for her and her children. They were orchestral in her being able to relocate to Florida. Richard Stowe was also a big part of the LDS Church Council, and he played a direct role in Ron Lafferty being excommunicated from the church. Ron then began to speak very openly to the School of Prophets more about his revelations and 
his views on what was called blood atonement. Blood atonement stems from Joseph Smith's teachings, and it basically says that some sins can be so severe, they can put the sinner beyond reach of the atoning blood of Christ. So their only hope for salvation is their own bloodshed. Ron then also began to describe these other revelations he was getting called removal revelations. In these revelations, Ron Lafferty claimed that God said there were four people that were destined to be removed from the earth. So I think we're going to stop it there for now. That is part one of this episode. Be sure to tune in next week for part two, where we'll get into the horrifying conclusion and much more discussion. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to tune in next week. And you can always share, subscribe, leave reviews to support the show. It's much appreciated. I hope you guys have a great week and I will talk to you next week. Bye.